Sunday, weekend, probably even Wednesdays, and you're lonely. And we want to encourage you to take those steps to get connected, to not be lonely. And we're so glad you're here. And you know, I believe the whole staff are committed ministers of loneliness. We want to encourage you. We want to connect with you. We want to facilitate meaningful relationships where you connect with people and you get to know them and they get to know you. And we squash the epidemic of loneliness. I believe that's true in, in our nation. There are people who are lonely. And so we want you to connect. So please go to the Welcome Center. Look at the Connect card. And you can connect in, in various ways between a Sunday school, a small group, a serving team, various ways. And we want to help you. There is no reason for you to be lonely. We want you to connect here at King Street. Well, I invite you to stand. And as we continue this journey of life in the name of Jesus, I want you to look at this scripture, Psalm 124. Our help, folks, our help is in the name of the Lord. Life in his name. Our help is in the name of the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Let's worship our Lord. All people that on earth do dwell, sing to the Lord with cheerful voice, him serve with fear, his praise forth tell. Come ye before him and rejoice. The Lord he know is God indeed without our aid he did us make we are his flock he doth us feed and for his sheep he doth us take oh, Join all the glorious names of wisdom, love, and power that ever mortals knew, that angels ever bore. All are to pour, to speak his word, to pour, to set my say. Joyful news of our salvation came. The joyful news of sins forgiven, of hell subdued, and peace with hell. Jesus, my great high priest, offered his blood. My guilty conscience sees no sacrifice beside. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. I invite you to join me in this scripture reading, responsively, abiding in Christ. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit remain. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, the man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth, I call you not as a servant, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Thank the Lord for his word.
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we are alive in you. You are the giver of life, and we give you praise for that. And we thank you, thank you uh, for the words of, uh, of the psalmist who said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he turned, was inclined unto me. He lifted me out of the miry clay, out of the mud and the slime, and set my feet upon a rock and put a new song in my heart. And we thank you, God, that you reach down to us. And without you reaching down to us, there would be no way of, of lifting us out of uh, sin and out of our uh, darkness and out of our uh, death to give to us spiritual life. And we praise you this morning for the life that we have in you and that you are the giver of, uh, of newness. As we read in your word, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creature, and we thank you that you give to us that uh, spiritual life that is not only life now, but life eternal, and we praise you for that today. And this morning, Father, as we worship you and we give you praise, we thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit who brings to us your word and uh, ministers to us that life in, in your name. And this morning we pray that the Holy Spirit would breathe and move throughout this congregation, touching us and ministering to our particular need. Because when we came in here this morning, we all came in with various needs that we uh, carry in our life for ourselves or for our family or for our loved ones and uh, for uh, neighbors and friends. And so we come this morning as needy individuals and ask you, Father, that you would touch each one of us at the point of our need today and help us to bring those needs to you and cast them before you, knowing that you care for us, knowing that you desire to be a part of our lives, ministering to us and uh, uh, bringing uh, hope out of uh, despair, uh, bringing light out of darkness into our lives. We pray for us who are here this morning. We also pray for those who are listening online and on the radio, and we pray that you would touch their lives as well today. And thank you, Father, for uh, the life that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And we pray that you would be with Jody as he, uh, Pastor Jody, as he comes and brings us a message that you would speak through him in a powerful way, your word to us today. And then, Father, thank you for the privilege of giving to you, of returning to you a portion of that which you have entrusted to us. Help us to be good stewards and help us to give to you, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
sing together. be seated and let's pray together. Oh God, blessed are you, God of all creation. You spoke in the beginning and all things came to be. You spoke and your word came to live with us, full of grace and truth and life. Bless this place once again today as we would hear your story. As the word is spoken, May you speak to us. May we all hear you lead in us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Morning, church. Good morning. My goodness, we have been celebrating the gospel, have we not? The gospel, the good news that God is sovereign and holy and just and awesome is he, and that we need help, need a rescuer, need deliverance, need the touch of God, and that Jesus Christ has come to bridge the gap between sinful humanity and a holy God, that we have a savior, we have a rescuer, we have one that loves us, and we are called, church, to respond in faith. Amen? Amen. Amen. We are called to respond in faith, to cry out to God, knowing that he loves us and that he sent his son Jesus to die for us and that in Christ we have life, that we are alive in Christ. Church, that's the gospel. We've been proclaiming it, celebrating it, singing about it. It's been the story we've been telling throughout this service, and we will continue to, to look into the Word of God. Turn with me, please, to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, I propose to you this is the most pivotal chapter ever penned in humanity. How's that for a grand statement? The most pivotal chapter ever penned in all of humanity, in the history of the world. There is not a more significant, world-changing, transformative, important chapter ever ever written. Many years ago, numerous years ago, I was a youth pastor. 
and uh, worked for many years with high school students. I'd walk in every Sunday morning, and I'd say, hey, you guys, how you doing? And I, I want to tell you, they always answered me the same way, with one word. I, 87, this is my anecdotal, 87% of the time, I would hear a high school student answer me with the same word on a Sunday morning when I would ask how they're doing. You know what that word was? Tired. Eighty-seven percent of the time. How you doing? Tired. And then I would say to them, "Oh, come on! It's Sunday morning. Do you know why we gather on a Sunday morning?" And over the years, I would then teach these high school students to answer me with the same phrase. You ready? I'm going to teach you. It was this phrase. Because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday. Hey, church, how you doing? (laughs) Come on! It's Sunday morning. Why do we worship and gather on a Sunday morning? Amen, because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday morning. We are here to celebrate a resurrection, a resurrected Lord Jesus who is alive early on the first day of the week. Sunday morning, same, same. Here we are. While it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon, Peter, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. That's John, the author. She said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb, both running. The other disciple outran Peter, reached the tomb first, bent over, looked in at the strips of linen lying there, didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. Church, this is a first hand account of exactly what happened that morning. John is telling you exactly what happened, corroborated by a second witness, Peter. He saw and what? Believed. They still didn't understand. From Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now, Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been. One at the head, one at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. She didn't realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned around toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means Teacher, Jesus says, don't hold on to me. 
for I am not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And on the evening of that first day of the week, later that night, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. After this, he said, or after this rather, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them. And said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, he wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came that evening. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hands into his side, I will not, what? Believe. I won't believe. I won't believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and he said peace be with you then he said to Thomas put your finger here see my hands reach out your hand put it into my side stop doubting and what believe Thomas said to him my Lord and my God Jesus said to him Jesus told him because you have seen me You have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have what? Believed. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may, what? Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. These are the verses, these two verses, coming at the tail end of this his pivotal chapter in Scripture, the resurrection. We come to the close of this chapter really is a summary of everything John has written. And we're going to really dig into that this year. And then John wrote this. Jesus performed many other signs. They're not recorded in this book. In fact, the very last verse of the next chapter of the whole book, John says, oh, if, if, if I had all the room in all of the books in all of the world, I really couldn't fit it all. That Jesus did. But I've made some choices. These are written that you may believe. And the NIV has a little textural note there that says continue to. So it's not just now in this moment. But they have been believing. They have come to a place of faith and belief. And he's saying these things are written that you may continue to believe. That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Just to kind of really drill down on these two verses, I want you to see it in a few other translations. You know, we have numerous translations of the original Greek, just different word choices. The ESV, the NIV tends to be a little more thought for thought versus word for word. The uh, ESV the English Standard Version, tends to be much more of a a word-for-word literal translation. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus, NIV said Messiah, Christ, 
the anointed one, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Almost identical, isn't it, to the NIV. How about the King James? Many of you here in this service raised on the King James. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. May is the word we've seen in the NIV and ESV. This King James says ye might have life through his name. How about the message? It's a modern day um, translation by Eugene Peterson. Jesus provided far more God-revealing signs than are written down in this book. These are written down so that you will believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and, and in the act of believing, have real and eternal life in the way he personally revealed it. Okay? Obviously very similar, a little different word choices. And then the new living. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the, one, the ones recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. It's interesting, this word believing. Matthew uses the word believe eight times in his gospel. Mark uses the word believe 15 times in his gospel. Luke uses the word believe nine times in his gospel. Anyone want to venture a guess on how many times John uses the word believe in his gospel? The answer is 85. <laughs> 85 times. Believe. I mean, we saw it over and over again just here in chapter 20. Believe. 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 There's two things I want to say this morning. Two points I want to make. Point number one, what we believe about Jesus matters what we believe about him deep down in our hearts these convictions that are rooted in our hearts what we truly believe in faith about Jesus matters and the second point I'm going to come back and visit these but the second point is this what we believe about Jesus has the potential ought to change our lives. Change our lives. Everything about our lives. Everything. What we believe about Jesus matters. How many of you are familiar with John 3.16? <laughs> it's the gospel in a nutshell, right? Right? For God so loved, that's King James, for God loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Why did God give his son? Okay, that was an easy question. That one wasn't hard. Come on, folks. Out of love, right? Okay, I know this isn't a classroom, but why... For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever, whoever, what? Believes. believes. There's one of the 85. In him shall not perish but have eternal life. Life eternal. There will be an eternal quality about their lives. And I'm just going to say, I'm not, not going to dig into that word today. Today. But as we make our way through this year, and as we look at what it means to have life in his name, I can tell you right now that that phrase, eternal life, is a very important phrase. What does that mean? We're going to get to a piece of that today, I, I, 
I pray, and my intention. But this eternal life, this eternal quality of life that we have in Christ. But I'm going to ask this question. Believe what? That whoever believes in him, believe what? Look again at John 20. What are we to believe? If believing is so important, which it is, what we believe about God and Jesus matters, believe what? Hmm. You know, John 20 really gets at that question. Early on the first day of the week, while it was dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance, so she ran to Simon Peter, John, the one Jesus loved, and said, okay, we're going to get a clue, very strong clue, into what Mary believed early that morning. When she saw that the tomb, that the stone was rolled away and that the tomb was empty, Mary believed something. She had a, 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 a belief that something happened. And what was that? She said it all, numerous times. They. We don't even know who. Th I don't think she even knows who they are because she looked at what she thought was who she thought was the gardener and thought he might be the they. But she said they. What? Taking the body. They've taken the, the Lord out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. So, so that's how resurrection morning began, with that belief that not that he was alive, but that they stole his body. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were right. What do you think Peter and John believed what do you think they believed on early resurrection morning do you think they shared the same belief that mary shared i, th I think so I, I think they they peter and john really believed the same thing mary believed and that was that someone had stolen his body and they, they got there and got to the tomb and they looked in then they walked, and Peter and then John came in after. And what did they see? Okay. Mm. Now, right, if someone had stolen his body, what would they have done? Taken it all, right? I mean, he was wrapped up in something like 80 pounds of linen and anointing oil, and right? They... they if someone had stolen his body, what would they have done? They would have gone in and picked up the body just as it was and left with it. So Peter and John go into the tomb now. They are confronted with some evidence. And that evidence is the linen is, all this burial cloth is still there. And the the cloth that wrapped his head is folded up beside it. And they then, you can just feel the wheels churning in their heart and their brain. And in that moment, what happened with Peter and John? The lights came on. <laughs> confronted with the evidence. And what was the truth that they came to believe in that moment? He's alive. He's alive. Nobody took this body. He is alive. In fact, that's exactly what finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb went inside. He saw and believed. Because up to this point, they hadn't understood from the scriptures that Jesus had to rise from the dead. And then they went back to where they were staying. Mary, she's still operating under this Belief that someone had stolen Jesus. But then when, she, when, when Jesus speaks her name, Mary, that just awoke her. 
And she realized this is, geez, she came to faith. Don't hold on to me. I've got to go to my father and your father. And then that night, Jesus comes in, sees the disciples, and they believed. But Thomas, right, he wasn't there. History records him as being a doubter. I, I, I don't think that's, I mean, yes, but he's a realist. <laughs> he, he had to see in order to, to what? To, to believe. And, and look at verse 28. Thomas said to him after he touched the nail scarred hands, side, my Lord and my God. So Thomas didn't just believe that Jesus was alive. What what connected with that belief? Faith that Jesus was was the Son of God. That he was the Lord of the universe. Jesus then said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and still believe. You see, our worship today is based on the belief, three essential truths. Our worship today is based on the belief that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is God, and that Jesus, and we saw this back in John 3, 16, loves us. (laughs) That he loves us. We base what we believe on those three truths, that Jesus is alive, that he is God, and that he loves us. What we believe about Jesus matters. And the second thing I said, second point, what we believe about Jesus has the potential to change our lives. These things, I'm I'm bumping here somehow, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may might you might this is a choice really or a an effect that might come to pass in our lives through the life that is in his name so the question that i would ask is how does believing that jesus is alive that he is god and that he loves us change the way that we live how does it give me life. I want to use an illustration uh, that I've actually been sharing with you a good bit this last year about my, my niece's son, Ethan. And as I thought about this question, how does believing that Jesus is alive, that he is God, and that he loves me, how does that change my life? How does that affect my life? And I, I thought about Christy, my niece. And she is here holding Ethan. This was a month or two ago. I will tell you, one of the reasons I think I wanted to bring this up is because Ethan had a very, very hard week. He's going through this antibody treatment, and the antibody treatment almost killed him this last week. He, uh, he's had a very hard week. Um, it somehow affected his lungs, this treatment they were giving him. He had reaction And he was right on the edge of really life and death a couple of days ago. He's on a ventilator. um, But praise be to God, he's turned a corner a couple days ago and is doing better. But as I, so please continue to pray for Ethan. But I want you to think about this relationship right here. Mom, Christy, Ethan. I want you to think about this relationship. And I'm going to ask this question, what difference does it make for Ethan to know, to believe, to know that Christy loves him dearly, is always with him, and will do everything in her power to care for him? I've asked that question before, but I'm asking it again today. What difference does it make for Ethan to know, to believe to the core of his being that his mother and Brian, his father too, certainly, absolutely, but for Christy to love him dearly. 
to always be with him, to do everything in her power to care for him. What difference does it make? And this is the question then that I ask all of us today. What difference can it make for us to know, to know, to believe, that Jesus loves us dearly? That he is always with us, always with us. And that he is doing everything in his power to care for us, which is ultimate power. He's in charge of the universe. He's God. It's the question I just asked a moment ago. How does believing that Jesus is alive, that he is God, and that he loves me change the way I live? How does it give me life? That's a question I'm really putting to each of you right now. How? What difference does that make? Turn with me briefly over to Matthew chapter 6. This to me is the application. This is the the heartbeat of what it means, I think, to have life in his name. (laughs) To have life in his name. Therefore, verse 23 of Matthew chapter 6, I tell you, do not worry about your life. You've seen that, right? Therefore, do not worry. Stay with me, church. This is what Jesus wants to say to you right now. Therefore, do not worry about your life. Stop worrying. Stop worrying. Don't worry. What you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, your body, what you wear... Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or stow away in barns. Yet your Father in heaven, what? Feeds them. Feeds them. Your Father in heaven is with them. He's over them. He takes care of them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Look at the flowers. They don't labor, spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendors dressed like these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which are here today and tomorrow thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You of little, what? Faith. Faith. Faith breeds trust. Faith is trust. Faith is knowing and believing that we have a loving God, that Jesus is alive, that he is God, and that he loves me. That he is with me, he is taking care of me. And that in that knowledge, that belief, that faith, that trust, I have absolute peace, joy, Knowing that God is with me, caring for me. Stop worrying. For the pagans, you know who pagans are? Pagans are people that worship other gods or have no God at all. Pagans run after those things. Pagans live their lives that way. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. So... What does it mean to have life in his name? Church, in two words, stop worrying. Jesus loves you. He's with you. He is in control. He is God. And the second thing that we see in this is look up. Look up. Verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Stop worrying and look up. Seek first the kingdom of God. Why? Because Jesus is alive 
Jesus is God and Jesus loves you. That's the truth. This is the power of believing. And the result is life in his name. Look up. Look up. I shared this verse out of Colossians with you a couple weeks weeks ago. So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, so if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up. Be alert to what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. Your old life is dead. Your new life, which is your real life, even though invisible to spectators, is with Christ in God. He is your life. As I close, turn with me to 1 John 5. 1 John 5. And I want to encourage you as you're studying the gospel of John to also look at 1 John. It is a companion letter to the gospel. John reiterates over and over again the things that he describes in the gospel. But I want you to look at what he says at the very end of his letter. 1 John chapter 5. Look at verse 11. And this is the testimony. Here's the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Life comes no other way. This life, eternal life, is in Jesus. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. What a statement. What a truth. I write these things, verses 13 and 14. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. That's us, hopefully. And if you don't, today's your day. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Know it. It changes the way you live. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Church, what's the essential truth of life in his name? It's the reality that Jesus is alive, that he is God, and that he loves us. So stop worrying. And look up. Know that he is with you always. He has wrapped you up in his arms. Nothing happens to you outside of his tender care. Everything that does happen to you is part of his plan for your life. Even the hard stuff. Jesus, we humble ourselves before you today. We come before you today, Jesus, believing that you are the Son of God. That you are alive, that you are risen from the dead, that you are seated in the heavenlies at the right hand of the Father, that you are our high priest, that you watch over us, that you care for us. Lord Jesus, in the same way that Ethan is held in the arms of Christy, Lord, I pray that right now you will hold us in your everlasting arms. And Lord Jesus, I pray that we will experience today new life in your name. That we will stop worrying because worry leads to all sorts of problems. (laughs) That at the heartbeat of our faith, Jesus, 
is the everlasting knowledge, the deep-seated belief that you care for us, that you watch over me. You take care of me. You look down. You love me. You're in me. You're with me. You carry me. I can't go anywhere that you're not with me. And Lord, even when I sin, when I stumble, when I fall, you are faithful and good and just and merciful to forgive me of all my sin when I confess them to you. Lord Jesus, help us today to look up, to seek first your kingdom, and to rest in our faith that you are alive that you are God, and that you love me. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing your praise. We worship you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Let's stand and let's declare our faith. to him who is able to keep us from stumbling and is able to make us stand in the presence of his glory, blameless and filled with great joy to the only God, our Savior, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord. To you, Jesus, be all glory and dominion, majesty and power today and forevermore. Amen and amen. Hey, church, let's go live the call.